admonished him on that. Prior to Mr. Rittenhouse testifying, this court addressed various things with not only Mr. Rittenhouse, but with the lawyers. You had cited various statutes, and then you had asked if there anything had, would be coming up on, for example, I think 90608. One of the other things you addressed was 90404. And you had said that based on the information that had come out at the trial, nothing had changed as it relates to your ruling. Shortly thereafter, Mr. Binger stated, and we looked it up, previously, he said to Mr. Rittenhouse, previously indicated that you wish to have your AR-15 to protect someone's property. Clearly in violation not only of the prior ruling that you had made, but the ruling that very day, that very morning. Um, it appears to be uh, that there are two really elements the court must consider when making a determination on a mistrial for what amounts to prosecutorial overreaching. And the first one is the prosecutor's actions must be intentional in the sense of a culpable state of mind in the nature of awareness that his activity would be prejudicial to the defendant. I would argue to you that that's clearly aware of that. You had warned him, uh, you had told him prior to uh, Mr. Rittenhouse testifying that these things, certainly the 90404 was off limits. You had warned him about the uh, infringement on his constitutional right to remain silent. He did it again. The second one, I think, requires some action by the court in terms of a finding. The second one says the prosecutor's actions was designed uh, to uh, allow uh, another chance to convict. That is, to provoke a mistrial in order to get another kick at the cat because the first trial is going badly or to, pre or to prejudice the defendant's rights to successfully complete the criminal confrontation at the first trial. Now, the, the case that I had cited is a Kenosha case. Um, State versus Coping? Coping? Yep. Uh, 100 with second, 700. C-O-P-E-N-I-N-G? Yes, sir. In that case, the court didn't make findings uh, regarding the prosecutor's actions. So I don't know that it's my role to sit here and say, who's winning? I, I don't think that's necessarily what I'm supposed to do. But I think the court has to make some findings as it relates to the bad faith on the part of the prosecution. And if the court makes a finding that uh, the actions that I had talked about were done in bad faith, then I think both elements uh, for mistrial with prejudice have been met. And I think under the circumstances, based on what I've put forth on the record, I would certainly ask the court to consider those um, and I would ask the court grant the motion uh, with prejudice. Thank you. Thank you. State? Yeah, I would like an opportunity to more fully respond to this um, in, uh, with a little bit of research. Um, at first blush, though, uh, and I, I reserve the right to present case law and additional um, uh, sites to the court, but I do want to point out for the record that the defendant has uh, presented interviews to uh, at least one media source and at least one online source uh, since his arrest. Um, and there have been questions about uh, that night. There have been questions about what he did, uh, things like that. Um, he has uh, decided, probably on, on advice of counsel in those certain circumstances, not to uh, give a statement in the media about what happened, but he is talking about his family life, he's talking about his friends, he's talking about the, the circumstances of the case, he's talking about how this has affected him and things like that. Um, so my point in asking those questions was, you have agreed to talk to the media, you've agreed to talk about yourself, you've agreed to give interviews, um, but until now, this is the first time you're explaining your actions. And so I'm not, I wasn't referring to his in custody statements, in fact, I never asked either detective about what the defendant told them. He actually starts to tell them some things, and then he says he wants a lawyer, and they stop him. And they Mirandize him first, by the way. 
Uh, then he starts to tell them some things, and then he says, but I want to talk to my lawyer. And they're like, OK, we're done. So I'm not referring to that. I didn't ask any questions of the detectives about that. Um, but since this, the defendant has spoken to the media. He has talked about his life, about circumstances related to this case. He just hasn't given his exact version of events that night. So his voluntary discussion to speak to the media uh, has nothing to do with the Fifth Amendment. That is his own decision. And if he's going to pick and choose what he wants to talk about in those uh, voluntary interviews with the media, then I think that's fair game. It doesn't implicate his Miranda rights. It doesn't implicate the Fifth Amendment. He's making his own voluntary choice. Well, wait a minute. You don't think he could give an interview about his, his uh, awards he won in high school or his demerits that he got or his, uh, and, 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 and about his sports activities and his swimming and, and that? And, uh, and declined to answer any questions about the incident in question, and that somehow a waiver of his right to silence? I, I think he's doing more than that, Your Honor, uh, in these interviews. Um, he I don't know. I, I knew nothing about them. I never, I, you know, I, I haven't seen all, all of, I haven't seen probably 1% of all the evidence, which is pretty typical, as you know. So I have no way of knowing it. Uh, you have some interview, uh, some interviews that he gave to a uh, media or to whatever. Yeah, there's an interview that I'm, we're looking at on our computer right now from um, the Washington Post, uh, where he talks to them. Um, I know there's one. Uh, I think it's either the New Yorker or the GQ magazine, uh, where he s speaks to the reporters also. Um, and he doesn't go into specific details about what happened that night, but it's not like it's talking about school or swimming or things well, like that. Well, no, 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 no. Just don't leave it at He doesn't go into specific details. Yes, I mean, it's, uh, it's certainly there could be a waiver by a very modest discussion about the activities of that night. And if you're suggesting that occurred, that could make a big difference. Um, but um, even, even a small discussion on his part of the uh, night in question might be a full waiver. I don't know, but I and I won't know until I see it. But uh, why don't you uh, make copies of it and? Uh, Can we have a few minutes to? to well, we won't do it right now. I, I I I do agree with you that this is not something that I would want to do. Um, sitting here uh, without giving you an opportunity to respond, um, although I would be interested in your preliminary response to uh, the. the excluded evidence that you uh, touched on after having been told not to do this or having been told that I was confirming my prior rulings. I do want to just point out right now we've got it on the screen. This is a Washington Post article uh, and there's a reference to an interview that he says, the defendant says he did not regret having his gun because, quote, I would have died that night if I didn't, end quote. So that's a direct quote from the defendant to the media about that night. What about that? Your Honor, all I can say about that interview is there were prior counsel representing him. Um, I don't care about that. Well, and, and I believe it was a telephone interview. I, I don't know anything about the circumstances of that. I'd have to read the article. Well, that might make a difference. Yeah. Um, and what, you know, what about the, um, uh, your, uh, asking questions about excluded evidence. Your Honor, the, we, went, we went over this earlier, and I'm, I don't want to repeat myself because I know you've heard me, but if I could just summarize. Uh, I did hear you talk about that evidence this morning before testimony. The defendant then took the stand. He admitted that he had said to the person in the yellow pants that he had pointed the gun at that person. I have seen that video. It was actually introduced by the defense. I think it was even in their opening statement. And there is this person who confronts the defendant and accuses him of this. Frankly, to be honest, Your Honor, when I watched the video the first time, I didn't hear the defendant's reaction. I thought it was someone making an accusation and then the defendant walking away as if trying to avoid a confrontation. I was surprised to hear the defendant admit in his testimony on direct by his attorney that yes, I did tell that person that I had pointed the gun at them. 
he explained then that he was joking when he said that. The jury can evaluate that. It goes to his credibility. It goes to whether or not he's telling the truth. It goes to his decision making. That is, again, this is an incident that occurred that night. So it's not something that happened separate in time. It presumably happened a few minutes before. Um, but I, like I said, I was taken aback by the defendant admitting that he had said to this person, yes, I pointed a gun at you. Um, and I think it's fair to say that watching that video, that that person, you know, believes strongly that this happened. The defendant is telling him it happened. Now the defendant today is giving us a different version and saying, oh, I made it, I was joking, I was just kidding that guy or whatever. I'd like to probe that. I'd like to probe what he said to that person. I'd like to probe what his motivations were, etc. I'd like to probe whether, in fact, he really did do that. Um, and I think that that changes the equation with regard to the CVS video that was the subject of the other acts motion. Because in my mind, it is very similar. And I know we've disagreed on that, and I'm not going to belabor the point, Your Honor, but that was where I was coming from, was there's been a change in the testimony of the defendant today that I think makes that evidence. It's admissible and much more relevant than it already was, and I thought it was already uh, relevant. And the court is, I, I do want to be clear so also. So I'm just here on the sidelines just to. Well, you. Yeah, I, I had made a ruling that the evidence wasn't coming in, and you decided that it was. I, I, if I could just respond to that briefly, Your Honor, I was about to say, I did not interpret your ruling as an absolute. We, we've had three state motions in the <laughs> There was one in which we asked the court to introduce evidence that the defendant was at Pudgy's Bar with Proud Boys, and you were clear, that is not coming in. There was- You know, don't get into other subjects. Get it, get, come on, what you're telling me, you're an experienced trial attorney, and you're telling me that when the judge says, I'm excluding this, you just to take it upon yourself to put it in because you think that you've found a way around it? Come on. If I may finish, Your Honor, I was about to say, <laughs> your, your ruling on our three motions and uh, uh, other acts motions was there were some gradations there. That you were clear that some things were absolutely out, and then you left the door open on other things. Uh, uh, you know. So I, I, I saw that distinction, and I thought to myself, clearly I know this is out, but you left the door open on other things. So I didn't interpret your ruling as this is absolutely never coming in, and I have practiced before you, Your Honor. I have filed other acts motions, motions before you. Your practice oftentimes is to reserve ruling on those until you see the evidence. And I think you even said something to that effect at our motion. I undoubtedly did. So I thought this is my good faith explanation to you. And if you want to yell at me, you can. My good faith feeling this morning after watching that testimony was you had left the door open a little bit. Now we had something new, and I was going to probe it. I don't believe you. There better not be another incident. I'll take the motion under advisement. Um, and you can respond. Um, when you say that, that you were acting in faith, good faith, I don't believe that, okay? Let's proceed. Everybody in good faith. All right. Um, bring, would you come up, please, Mr. Rittenhouse? I do have... Yeah. Your Honor? Yeah. I do have another um, item that I want to raise before the jury comes in and raise it with you. Um, there was an other acts motion with regard to the defendant being at Pudgy's Bar after a court appearance in January in which he poses for selfies wearing a shirt that says free as fuck. I would like to ask the defendant if he posed for selfies after a court appearance with members of the public wearing that shirt. I do not intend to talk about who those people were, what groups they were affiliated with, or anything along those lines. But I believe that it is relevant when the defendant goes to a bar after a court appearance and poses for selfies wearing a shirt like that. I think it is relevant to some of the issues that have come up in this case. For example, his remorse or lack of remorse, his uh, utter disregard for human life, uh, those are things that I think it comes into play because I think that behavior is not consistent with someone who has a regard for human life. The jury has already watched him break down on the stand with emotion. I'd like to probe how heartfelt and sincere these emotions are when you go to a bar and you pose for selfies with people. When you're out on bond in a first degree intentional homicide trial wearing a free as fuck shirt. So, 
as I said, I want to use the photograph. I'm not going to talk about any of the people or who they were from. In fact, the photograph I'm going to use has actually got their faces blocked out. So we won't see any of the people in the crowd. We'll just see the defendant standing with a group of people for a selfie with that shirt on. That's as far as I want to go. Daniel, this issue. Nobody got an opportunity. First of all, you've made a ruling on it, and it was clear prior to him testifying. So part of this is, would we have raised it? Would we have brought it up if we, if we would have known that it was going to be coming in? We have done not, there's been nothing to open this door, Judge. Nothing that has been said to open the door about what happened four months after this is relevant in any way to what happened that evening. That is part of what the court had ruled. You had said four months after, I don't see how that goes to any 90404 type of uh, admissible evidence. So my argument is, A, you ruled on it previous to him testifying. You confirmed your ruling, which you had made previously, where Mr. Binger just said you had shut the door on it. So apparently he doesn't believe a door that is shut should stay shut. However, now he's asking that something be admitted that, to be fair, this should have been brought up sooner. This jury, I, I would have, I did the void deer, I would have void deered on an issue of whether or not they heard it, saw it, or were aware of it, how they felt about it, whether it uh, had an impact on their ability to be fair in the case. We never went there because of your prior ruling. So there's nothing that's opened this door, and I don't think it's relevant something that happened four months later. He talked about uh, indifference to human life. That's that night, not four months later. There's nothing, nothing that's relevant about that. You've already made your ruling. I ask that you stick with it. Uh, I'm struggling with why it would be relevant to any of the issues in this case. Um, you know, if, if you, he were on trial for using exquisitely bad judgment, if he were on trial for behaving in a very offensive way, uh, then I could see the purpose. But an incident that occurred four months after the incidents in question, I don't see how that jury can work with that in reaching any conclusions about the issues in this case. First of all, Your Honor, we have introduced evidence that the defendant had a, <coughs> a slogan on his TikTok page, Bro, I'm just trying to be famous. This case has made him famous, and he's posing for selfies as a result. One of our theories of this case is that his behavior that night was intended to gain attention, to be famous, and he's reaped the benefits of that. Second of all, he is on trial, in, in my opinion, for exquisitely poor decision making. Taking a gun that he's not legally entitled to have, coming down in violation of the curfew, running around the community with that gun, trying to be a police officer when he's not, uh, confronting protesters that he knows are hostile, and uh, all of those behaviors, I think, are exquisitely bad judgment. So the jury can make that decision. The jury can give what weight they want to this evidence, but it's, the, it's moments after he has a court appearance here. He's on, out on bond on, in this case when he decides to do this behavior, and nobody made him do it. Nobody forced him to go to the bar. Nobody forced him to wear the shirt. Nobody forced him to pose for selfies. It's his own decision making. And when I, I, you know, when I tried, when I when I made reference to exquisitely poor judgment, I was talking about at the incident when he was wearing the shirt. Because uh, you look, uh, everybody uh, in, in all of humanity, at one time or another, displays bad judgment, sometimes exquisitely bad judgment, and we don't let it into people's trials on unrelated matters. So I, I wasn't referring to his having had bad good or bad judgment on the day in question. Uh, that's a legitimate inquiry, and you're being allowed to present a lot of evidence on that subject. And the jury is going to be instructed on in some of the uh, the element of some of the crimes that are charged here, is going to uh, deal with the ca the caliber of his judgment. But you're talking about an incident that occurred four months later. So I'm not seeing it, and I don't want to waste any more time with it. Uh, I. I um, 
I don't think so. I've ruled before it's not admissible, and I have heard nothing to change my mind about that. It was sought to be admitted earlier for a different I, purpose, Your Honor. I'm sorry. It, it was sought to be admitted earlier for a different purpose than it is today. I, the court has ruled that it can't be admitted for the prior purpose, but I am seeking to introduce it for a different purpose today. And that request is denied. Thank you. Okay. Are we ready to go?